I want to thank you so much if you're visiting with us this evening. I want to thank those who are members here at East Albertville for your presence here tonight. I made the comment to more than one, I think, that this is really a good audience. This is really a good group of people to speak to, and I'm so happy to be able to be here this week and to be able to do that. I appreciate your kind attention, your focus, your kind words, your encouragement. And one of the things I realized is this, is that listening is work, just even as speaking is work. It's mental work. There are thought processes that go on while you're doing that. And so I appreciate so much your kind attention as we've been going through these studies, these lessons this week. I don't think I've made mention of this before. I know that those who have made announcements have, but I appreciate those who may be taking advantage of the opportunities to watch online as well. And so we'd like to recognize and express our appreciation to you also. We're going to be looking at a text this evening from the book of Isaiah. Our focus is going to be on Isaiah chapter 46, verses 8 through 11. Isaiah chapter 46, verses 8 through 11. And I think what I'd like to do is to go ahead and begin reading the verses that we're going to be focusing on, or at least that we're going to be taking our lesson from this evening. We'll read the verses, then we'll go back and make a couple of observations about the book of Isaiah as a whole and about this immediate context here. Uh, specifically, beginning in verse 8 of Isaiah chapter 48, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 46, the prophet says, Remember this and be assured. One translation translates the word assured there is brave. It says, Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things long past. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things which have not been done. And then he goes on and says, saying, My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country. Truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it. Surely I will do it. There's so much in this very rich setting here, these uh, very rich verses here. God is asserting his power. He's asserting his wisdom. He's asserting his sovereignty. He's asserting the fact that when he plans something, he carries it out. He is able to accomplish it. And one of the things that he's trying to impress these people here with and that he's wanting them to understand is the fact that being able, being almighty, being all-powerful, being all-wise, being able to say, I'm going to do this and I carry it out, he wants them to have faith in his word. He wants them to have faith in his power, in his promises, in his providence, in his almighty ability to do the things that he says that he's going to do. We've entitled our lesson this evening, as you might have noticed on the front screen, God's Amazing Planner. God's Amazing Planner. Now, I think we're familiar with what a planner is. We might call it a scheduler, something like that. Some of us might have a calendar on a wall, and we mark in the little boxes when we have events or appointments or maybe classes or just some kind of thing that, that, that we want to remember, something that we are planning on doing. Maybe it's a trip. Maybe it's a meeting with someone. Maybe it's uh, someone that's going to visit us or someone that we're going to visit. But we, we, we have planners in our own lives. Maybe it's not a calendar hanging on a wall. Maybe it's a pad that is laying on a desk. Or maybe it's an app on a phone. Or maybe you're just really, you know, you, you have such a keen mind that you don't need any of that. That you just store that up and you say, I, I'm going to remember that. I know that. But anyway, we ha we're familiar with what we're talking about here this evening. Well, something else that we know is that when it comes to our planners, our plans, our schedules, things don't always happen the way that we plan them. Events don't always come to pass. Visits don't always come to pass. Uh, appointments don't always come to pass. And there are a number of different reasons for that. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe somebody cancels on us. Maybe something takes place that is just totally unforeseen. And so those plans have to what? They have to change. I'm fortunate that I have a very patient dentist and a very patient chiropractor. And if you don't understand what I'm saying by that, I'm saying this. There have been times that I have missed appointments 
simply because I forgot them, even though I might have had, have had them written down. I know that sounds kind of strange. But things happen, and sometimes our plans just don't go through just like we have them, just like we have scheduled them. But we know that that is not true with God. And God says, this is what I'm planning. This is what I'm going to do. He does it. He carries it out without fail. And he's wanting these people here to understand that in this context. Let's make just a couple of general observations about the book of Isaiah. And I'll go ahead and, and mention this. What I want us to do for the bulk of our study this evening is to go through a series of things that God did. A series of things that God planned, I think we could say. A series of things that God has done on His schedule. So we can look back and we can see that God planned this, God scheduled this, God did this on His own timing, we might say. And so it gives us faith in His power, in His promises, in His providence, so that we know whatever He says He is going to do, that we can, as the context or the translation said a while ago, we can be assured, we can be confident, we can be brave that that thing is going to come to pass. Just a couple of words on the book of Isaiah. You may remember that the book of Isaiah has 66 chapters. That's really pretty easy to remember, isn't it? That corresponds to something else, doesn't it? And that the book of Isaiah quite naturally divides into two primary sections, chapters 1 through 39 and chapters 40 through 66. Interestingly enough, that corresponds to something else as well, doesn't it? The books of the Old Testament and the books of the New Testament. What we find primarily in that first section of the book of Isaiah is the prophets or God's condemnation of sin and his telling of judgment that is going to come, not only upon the nation of Judah, but upon the various heathen or foreign nations as well. And a lot of what we find then in that second section in chapters 40 through 66 are words of hope, are words of comfort, are words of consolation for those troubled times. In fact, among the things that the prophet says is going to take place, he says, you can be comforted because there is a remnant that is going to return from captivity. There's a temple that is going to be rebuilt. And of course then, he expresses this ultimate comfort and consolation in the fact that God is going to bring the Messiah into this world. And he's going to come in the last days and he's going to bring about salvation. Now having said that, those two sections and those two themes that we've mentioned are not mutually exclusive to those sections. Because you recall, I'm sure, that in those first 39 chapters, we, we have chapters. Like chapter 2, prophecy of the kingdom. And chapter 7, the prophecy of the virgin birth. Uh, chapter 11, the prophecy concerning Jesus coming of the seed of, of David. Uh, and, and maybe some others that might come to mind. But by and large, we see two major themes that occupy those two major sections of those 66 books. But when we get down to Isaiah chapter 46, we see that God, and I'm going to back up, and I'm going to be reading the first few verses of this from the King James translation, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 46, where he says here, Bel boweth down, Nebo stoopeth. Their idols were upon the beast and upon the cattle. Your carriages were heavy laden. They are a burden to the weary beast. They stoop, they bow down together. They could not deliver the burden, but themselves are going into captivity. Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are borne by me from the belly and are carried from the womb. And even to your old age, I am he. And even to your whoreheads, I will carry you. I have made you. And I will bear you. Even I will carry and will deliver you. And then verse 5. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be like? They lavish gold out of the bag and weigh silver in the balance and hire a goldsmith and he maketh a god. They fall down. Yea, they worship. They bear him upon their shoulder. They carry him. They set him in his place. And he standeth from his place. Shall he not remove Yea, one shall cry unto him, yet he cannot answer nor save him out of his trouble. And so God is saying this, I think. He said, those idols that the Babylonians, that they worshiped, that they would fall down to, those idols, they're going to be carried away. Idol gods don't carry anyone. They don't bear anyone. They're going to be carried away. They were going to be carried away into captivity. God was going to bring a nation upon the nation of Babylon. 
And of course, it was the nation of Babylon that took the nation of Judah captive. He was going to bring a bird of prey, as we read in those last couple of verses there. That would be Cyrus the Mede of Persia, who would bring down the Babylonian Empire. But what he is doing here, he is comparing himself as the one true and living God with these false gods. And he shows what an absurdity that it was to bow down before one of these idols. He said a person takes gold or silver out of their bag, they take it to a metalsmith, that metalsmith forms this thing, this image, this idol, whatever it is, and then that person falls down and, and worships it. And then he picks it up, he carries it on his shoulder, and he sets it somewhere. And he says, and, and then he would try to speak to it, but what? It doesn't hear him can't speak. There's no deliverance. There's no salvation there. And it's not the only place in Isaiah that we find this kind of comparison made. On the other hand, we find in Isaiah chapter 40, as there God is ascribing himself and his power, says he holds the waters in the hollow of his hands. Think of all the waters that cover this earth here. God is spoken of as holding them in the hollow of his hand. It says he measures the universe with a span. You know, we don't know just how vast, how expansive this universe is. Because, you know, God is so mighty. He's so powerful. He measures it from the tip of his thumb to the end of his finger, I think, is basically what is being said there. And it talks about him weighing the sand and the mountains in a balance, just how big and great and powerful that God is. But the one he's making here is this, and what we want to look at for just a few minutes this evening is this. What God has done, what God has said he would do, he has carried out. He has accomplished on his timetable. Let's go through just several of these, and we're going to make somewhat of a survey of these. Let's begin by making this point. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I would simply assert this, that God created the heavens and the earth at the time that he chose to, on his schedule, on his timetable, so to speak. He wasn't under any duress. It wasn't some kind of accident. We see a very orderly creation there in some six days. There wasn't some kind of big bang that took place and all of this design and order that we see in this universe took place. God who dwells in eternity, who always was, and I know that's beyond our finite minds, our finite imagination, that God always was. He is eternal. Everything that we're familiar with on this earth has a beginning and has an end. But he brought all things into being. He spoke this universe into existence at the time of his choosing. In other words, he started the clock on his timing, on his schedule. He created all things in an orderly fashion. And the same, day who, the same God who spoke this universe into existence, this orderly universe into existence, one day will stop it. He will bring it to an end on his schedule. And that will be the last thing that we'll talk about this evening. You can look at some of these texts here, Psalms chapter 33, beginning there in verse 9, talks about God speaking, speaking this universe into existence. Exodus chapter 20, there are verses 8 through 11, builds the foundation for the law that was given under the law of Moses, to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, from the fact that God created everything in six days, the heavens and the earth and the seas, and that he rested the seventh day. Jesus in Mark chapter 10 and verse 6 says, from the beginning he made them male and female. God created this heavens and this earth, this material universe at the time that he chose on his schedule. We've talked about the fact already this week that when you go through the first two chapters of Genesis, everything is really good. When you go to chapter 3 and the end of it, everything has changed drastically because Satan has come on the scene and Adam and Eve are being driven out of the Garden of Eden. We have in chapter 4, among other things, the account of Cain and Abel, and we see genealogies, lineages that begin to be given there of Cain and then of Seth. And if you turn over with me to Genesis chapter 5 and then Genesis chapter 6, we see that by the time we get to Genesis chapter 6, just how sinful everything had become. And in fact, in Genesis the 6th chapter, and reading there beginning with verse 3, God decided that he was going to wipe mankind off of the face of the earth. But again, he was going to do that on his schedule, as we would say, according to his planner, so to speak. He's so going to give mankind 120 days, I'm sorry, 120 years from the time he says, you're so evil, I'm going to destroy you, to the time that the flood came. Beginning in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3, God said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. 
And I understand that to be say, that God to be saying there, this is how long things are going to continue on before I bring judgment, before I bring this cataclysmic judgment upon the face of the earth. And basically, wipe humanity with the exception of eight people off of the face of the earth and would even change the face of the earth. And of course, we find here that Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. There's some important principles to see here in the person of Noah. We see that Noah's salvation is based upon grace and faith and obedience. And the same principles have adhered all throughout God's dealing with mankind. There's God's grace that is essential. We find faith is essential. And that being an obedient faith, that we do what God says. But you know something that I think maybe sometimes we don't see quite as clearly or maybe we overlook from time to time when we think about the flood is the fact that this 120-year period here then manifested the long-suffering nature of God. We see the wrath of God. We see the judgment of God in the flood. But what about this 120 years here? Well, 1 Peter chapter 3, there are verses 20 and 21. When once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, were in few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Think about how long-suffering God was. As here humanity is, and in the fifth verse, it's described as being so wicked in, in the earth that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Sometimes I think we think, well, you know, things have never been worse than what they are today. Well, things aren't really bad today. I think every one of us would agree to that. But you think about a world where there are only eight people who are going to be saved because we're told that everyone, every imagination of the thoughts was only evil continually. And so we see the long-suffering nature of God. We'll talk about that again toward the end this evening. What's God doing here? Well, Noah is a preacher of righteousness. He's preaching a message. We're not told what the words were, but it's hard to believe that one of them wasn't <laughs> repent. You know, there, there's judgment that is coming. And even there's an object lesson there. You think about that ark that Noah is building. 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 50 feet high. You know, folks have to be walking by saying, Noah, what are you doing? What, what is that about? God's going to bring a flood upon the earth and he's going to destroy this world. We see the long-suffering nature of God, but we also see the wrath of God as he brings the flood upon the world. The fountains of the great deep burst asunder. The floods come down from the heavens. The high hills are covered some 15 cubits, and eight people are spared. I think there's another lesson that we could take from that, and that's the fact that it was a small minority. We might say even an infinitesimal minority that saved on that occasion. I think sometimes people look at the religious world and they see thousands and thousands of people maybe who are assembling somewhere and they think something like this. Well, now, all of those people couldn't be wrong, could they? Look at how large that number is. Think about how large, and we're not told uh, numerically how large the number was. It was destroyed in the flood. But undoubtedly, many, many, many people populating the world by that point in time, and only eight of them are spared. But our primary point right here is this. God, on his schedule, his timetable, he brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly. We're going to skip ahead here a little bit in the Bible story, the account of God's dealing with mankind. And in Genesis chapter 15, and here verse 16, and we'll do just a little bit of background before we begin talking a lot about that text. We've mentioned the fact, and I know that you're aware of the fact, that in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, we have there the first promise of a Messiah. There God speaking to the serpent said, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so what God is saying here to the serpent is, there's going to be one who's going to come into this world. God is going to send one into this world who is going to be victorious over the devil, over the destroyer, over the great dragon, so many different names that Satan is referred to, over the serpent that deceived in the Garden of Eden, one who is going to be born of a woman. But of course, for one to come into this world and to be born of a woman, there had to be a family, there had to be a lineage. And God chose Abraham to be the head of that family through whom the Savior, through whom the Redeemer, the one who had crushed the head of a serpent, would come. We find that at the end of Genesis chapter 11 and going there into Genesis chapter 12. And in Genesis chapter 12, 
In those first seven verses, we find there three great promises that God makes to Abraham. There are other promises that are made there. but We often focus on three of those promises, and I think rightly so, as we see God's dealing with mankind. God told Abraham, I'm going to make of your descendants a great nation. And he said, I'm going to give to your descendants the land of Canaan. And he said, and in you will all the nations of the earth be blessed. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18, a little bit later he said, and you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, or in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. But here in Genesis chapter 15, God is telling Abraham some things that were going to take place for his seed, that great nation, the nation of Israel, descended from Abraham, that were going to take place before they inherited the land of Canaan. In other words, he's saying, this is the schedule. This is what's going to take place hundreds of years before it takes place. I'm just going to summarize some things that we find in that context there. But in Genesis chapter 15, beginning there in about verse 13, God in speaking to Abraham said, your descendants are going to be a stranger in a foreign land. And he said, and they're going to be afflicted some 400 years. But he said, God is going to judge that nation that is afflicting them. What we understand is that he's talking about the children of Egypt, I'm sorry, the children of Israel, uh, the, the sons of Jacob going down into Egypt, and they're becoming enslaved and treated very cruelly by Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. And God raising up Moses to be a deliverer. And so he says, Abraham, you're going to die. You're not going to see this promise. But he says, they're going to come out in the fourth generation. There's a lot of specificity here, isn't there? And it comes to pass, even as God said that it would. You go to Genesis chapter 6. They're beginning in verse 14 and following. We learn, of course, that Jacob and his sons go into Egypt. Joseph is already there. Joseph has been put there by God for a very specific reason, hasn't he? And Joseph comes to see that. Joseph has been put there by God, I think providentially, in order to spare, in order to save uh, Jacob's children, the, the, the uh, sons of Israel. But what we find there is that one of those sons is a man by the name of Levi, who goes into Egypt with his father Jacob. Levi has a son by the name of Kohath. Kohath has a son by the name of Amram. Amram's wife is a woman named Jochebed. Amram and Jochebed have a son whose name is Moses. Well, they have another son as well, a son who is three years older, and of course his name was Aaron. But what we see then is in that fourth generation, from Levi down to Moses, God is going to fulfill what he said. Abraham, your seed are going to be afflicted. They're going to spoil those folks. That is, they're going to take from them when they leave but they're going to come out in that fourth generation. And it came to pass just as God had said that it would. Well, we understand that Moses leads the children of Israel out of this land of bondage. There's a series of plagues that bring judgment upon the Egyptian pharaoh, the blood, the frogs, the lice, the flies, all of those things. And then toward the end, the locusts, and then the darkness, and then the death of the firstborn the death of the firstborn, where there God instituted the Passover. The Israelites were told to do what? To take a lamb, a lamb without blemish, a lamb without spot. They were to slay that lamb. And they were to sprinkle the blood of that lamb on their doorpost. God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So we see the beginning of the Passover. But what we see then is that Israel goes down to the Sinai Peninsula. There at Mount Sinai, they receive the law. And some point after that, they begin to work their way back up toward the land of Canaan. They get to a place called Kadesh Barnea. And if you turn over with me to Numbers there in chapters 13 and 14, we see that 12 spies are sent into the land. We mentioned this just the other night, that 12 spies are sent into the land. And what happens is they stay there 40 days spying out the land, seeing what the people are like, seeing what the crops, the produce are like, and things of that nature. And they come back. And ten of them make this very evil report, this very cowardly report. They say, it's a wonderful land. It flows with milk and honey, but we're too weak. We can't take it. We're not going to be able to do that. And there, of course, are Joshua and Caleb, those two faithful men. And they say, let's go. We, we can take this land. God is on our side. 
And the other guys are saying, what? No, we look like grasshoppers compared to those giants. And what we're getting up to is this. Moses intercedes on behalf of the children of Israel again, doesn't he? There's a lot more we could say about that perhaps in a different lesson. God says, Moses, I'll just slay them all and I'll start over with you. But what we find taking place is this. The punishment that then they are left to bear. God says, you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. At Kadesh Barnea, they were on the doorstep, so to speak. And had only been on the road for approximately two years. They weren't far away from the land of Canaan. But because of that sin, God said, you got to wander in this wilderness for 40 years till all these fighting men over the age of 20, their carcasses are going to be strewn in this wilderness. They're going to die. And that took place just as God had said that it would. They wandered in that wilderness for 40 years just as God had said, just as God had, had scheduled, we might say, because of their disobedience. One way that I'm going to point that out is simply by looking at uh, the ages of Moses at the time that the children of Israel leave and then at the time that he dies on Mount Nebo. He's 40, I'm sorry, he's 80 when they leave and he's 120 on Mount Nebo. There are 40 years there. They wander there a total of 40 years. Let's talk about another thing that we find. And God doing on His schedule, just as He said that He would. Children of Israel enter into the land of Canaan. We talked last night about how that God wanted them to be delivered, and He raises up judges to oversee them and to deliver them to fight their battles against their enemies. The people come, they say, we want a king. God lets them have a king. Saul is the first one, first king of the United Kingdom. Following him, of course, is David, and then his son Solomon. Then the kingdom divides into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. But I want to mention this before we go any further than that. In Deuteronomy chapters 28 through 30, Deuteronomy chapters 28 through 30, sometimes we call those the chapters of blessing and cursing, Moses speaking, imploring the children of Israel. They're right there on the, the, the brink of entering into the promised land. They're on the other side. They're on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Moses is saying, obey God. Keep His commandments. Do what He says. Worship Him. Keep His statutes over and over. He says, and He will bless you. He will be with you. He will fight your battles for you. You'll prosper in all that you do. But if you turn away from Him, if you disobey Him, if you go after idols, if you go after the idols of the land, if you turn away from His commandments, He'll punish you. And He'll bring all kind of plagues and disease. And eventually, He'll take you off of this land. And so Moses sets that before them. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, Moses says there, See, I have set before you this day life and death. And what does he say? He implores them, therefore choose life. But of course, we know what they did, don't we? <laughs> they chose death, didn't they? Because eventually, they wandered away from God. They became idolatrous. The nation of Israel had no good kings whatsoever. It goes into Assyrian captivity. In 722, the nation of Judah was a little bit different. The nation of Judah had some good kings. They had a lot of evil kings, people that did things like Manasseh and, and others with their idolatry and homosexuality and offering children as sacrifices and, and things of that nature. And I know Manasseh repented toward the end, but, but he illustrates the evil that comes into that nation there. And so God sends the Babylonians to take the nation of Judah captive. And there are three forays, three raids we might say, I guess. They begin in about 606 B.C., then another one in 597 B.C., and the first one, Daniel, Shadmach, Meshach, and Abednego are taken. And the second one, Ezekiel, is taken. And then about 586, we see Nebuchadnezzar comes back, and there's the crushing blow. The walls are torn down. The temple is destroyed. And the people of Judah are taken away captive. But what had been foretold? In Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 11, and also Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 10, God had said there's going to be 70 years of captivity. The time that they would spend in captivity would be on God's schedule. 
It'd be according to his planner, so to speak. And I'm going to turn over to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. 2 Chronicles chapter 36, just for a moment, because here we have a text at the end of 2 Chronicles 36 that ties some of this together. Beginning in verse uh Beginning in verse 21 of 2 Chronicles 36, it says, To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah unto the land that had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. That's what the prophet Jeremiah had foretold. Here the writer of the Chronicles refers to them. And then in verse 22, he's going to talk about this man by the name of Cyrus. In Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 28, we find there that some 150 years before Cyrus is even born, God names him. He says, I'm going to raise him up. He is my anointed. He's the one who is going to send a remnant back to rebuild the temple. And so we see about 536, this decree is issued by this man by the name of Cyrus, king of Persia. It says that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished and the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom. And he put it in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. And a remnant returns. A lot more we can say about that, but here's our point here. God said 70 years. And long before that, he even named the ruler that was going to issue this decree. And it happened just the way that he said it would, when he said that it would. Let's look at just a few more of these. And this time we're going to move on into the New Testament. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. And the point that we're going to make right here is this. Is that at the time that God chose, at the time of God's choosing, at the time of God's planning, at the time of His purpose, He sent Jesus into this world. He sent Jesus into this world. When we read in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, that when the fullness of the time was come, God sent His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. It can't help but take our minds back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, can it? Where God, way back there, to the serpent said, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Here comes the Son of God, born into this world at the time of God's planning, at the time of God's choosing. And of course, He does that in fulfillment of all these types and shadows and prophecies. You look back and you study through the Old Testament. The Passover, as this instituted, the Passover lamb, that's pointing to Christ, the ultimate Passover lamb. Book of Numbers, when the people sin and they're bitten of those fiery serpents, and Moses is told to erect a brazen serpent up on a pole so that whenever anyone who was bitten would look upon that serpent, they would be healed. Jesus in John chapter 3 says, in essence, what? That was talking about me. That was something that foreshadowed me. And so many others that we could talk about. The mercy seat there on the Ark of the Covenant. The sacrifices and, and so many other things. When the time was right, at the time appointed by God, Jesus came into this world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent His Son into the world. Though He were rich, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, though He were rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that ye through His poverty might be rich. There's no way that, again, our finite minds can understand what Jesus left when He came down from heaven, was born into this world, took upon Himself flesh and blood, lived as a man, suffered all the things that He did. Not very roughly and not very well. Try to illustrate it kind of like this, and it's a horrible parallel because it doesn't begin to touch the hem of the garment. Let's say you take the richest person on the face of the earth. I don't know who that is. A multi, multi billionaire, whoever it might be. And you take him away from their, you know, huge mansion and planes and fleet of automobiles and. Uh, you know, those who work for them and, you know, just uh, all of that kind of thing. They no longer have their position as president or CEO or, you know, whatever it might be. And they live under a bridge. 
That doesn't begin to describe the drop. That doesn't begin to describe the difference as to what Jesus left when He left the glory and grandeur of heaven and came to this earth and lived as a man, lived as a servant, came to minister. You picture the sinless Son of God when in John chapter 13, He's going to be betrayed that night by Judas, one that He chose. He takes a towel and girds Himself and begins to wash the feet of the apostles, the Creator of this universe. He came when the fullness of the time was right, at the time of God's choosing. God's eternal purpose is executed. Jesus came into this world. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1 and verse 1. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Our point here is that at the time of God's choosing, Jesus came into this world. Let's think again. The death of Jesus was at the time of God's choosing, at the time of God's planning. I don't think any book bears that out perhaps as much as the Gospel of John. You remember as you read through the Gospel of John, something would take place in Jesus early on will say something like this. What? My hour is not yet come. My time has not yet come. I'm referring to passages such as uh, John 7 and verse 30 or John chapter 8 and verse 20 right there. But then when you get to John chapter 12, and verse 23. And John chapter 12, really on through uh, the, the crucifixion of Jesus, really is about the last week there in the life of Jesus. So much of the book of John has to do with the last week of Jesus' life. When you get to John chapter 12 and verse 23, Jesus now is saying this, And Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And he's talking about his death and the glorification that would follow that. Jesus wasn't crucified. He wasn't slain, nailed to the cross because He came to do something else and He was rejected. Not because He came to establish some kind of earthly kingdom and it didn't work out right. Jesus wasn't slain just because of some kind of happenstance or, or something of that nature. Jesus was crucified when He was, at the hour that He was because that was the time of God's choosing. Here we have the Lamb of God. You remember when John, in John chapter 1, is introducing Jesus. He sees Jesus coming. And what does he say? Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God was crucified at the time of God's choosing. He's crucified at the time of the Passover. You think about that. And then again, as we think about that, we understand that the church began at the time of God's choosing. And by the way, something I want to just briefly interject here that's not on our screen is that the resurrection took place at the time of God's choosing. Jesus had foretold Himself. Destroy this temple in what? In John chapter 2. And in three days I'll raise it up. But it had been foretold or foreshadowed even longer than that, hadn't it? When Jonah was in the belly of that great fish three days and three nights, and Jesus said, you know, no sign is going to be given this evil and adulterous generation other than the sign of the prophet Jonah. He was going to be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights, even as Jonah was in the heart of that, of that fish. But what we find here in Acts chapter 1 and verse 7, then Acts chapter 2, 16 and 17, is that the church begins on the day of Pentecost, and that was the time of God's choosing. The apostles ask a question in Acts chapter 1. They said, are you this time going to restore the kingdom again to Israel? And in verse 7, the Lord said to him, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in His own power. In other words, these things will take place when? At the time that God has chosen, at the time that God has ordained. And when the Apostle Peter begins preaching there in Acts chapter 2, about verse 16, what does he say? He says, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He's quoting there from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. Joel had foretold that in the last days, the Lord's Spirit would be poured out upon all flesh. Daniel had foretold in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44 that the Lord's kingdom, His everlasting kingdom, would be established in the days of those kings. You follow that progression of kings there in Daniel chapter 2? And those kings would be the Roman Empire. The Romans are in power here in the first century when the church, when the kingdom is established the church began on God's schedule. 
We could talk about other things. We could talk about the destruction of Jerusalem, couldn't we? Jerusalem was, was destroyed at the time of God's choosing. Jesus talks about that toward the end of Matthew 23 in Matthew's account and on into chapter 24. But I want us to end with this this evening. We mentioned at the outset, as we think about how God has done things on His timing, His schedule, He started the clock. He dwells in eternity, but He started the clock when He brought this material universe into existence. One day, that clock's going to stop. One day is going to be the last day. It's going to be the end. We're used to living in this material universe and seeing material things and having material things and enjoying the good things of this life. Maybe it's hard for us to think about someday that all of this is going to pass away. All of this is going to be gone. There's going to come a time that time is not reckoned. That the days are no more. Look with me as we think about it, and I'll go ahead and put that last point up here. John chapter 6. John the 6th chapter refers to the fact that there is going to be a resurrection at the last day. There's going to be a resurrection at the last day. When the last day comes, there are not going to be any more days to follow that. There's going to simply be eternity. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning there in verse 16. Here the Apostle Paul describes some things that are going to take place on that day, and this is what he says. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Jesus said in John chapter 5 in verses 28 and 29, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Preachers often have an occasion to speak at a graveside. And one of the observations I have made the last few times I have done it is simply this. It may just be a few stones there. I've spoken to graveside, and I'm sure Brother Hall, maybe some others say, were there hundreds and thousands, maybe thousands? Elmwood, for example, in Birmingham. I forget how many thousands there are there. And made the point, one day, every one of these graves is going to be open. Every one of these graves is going to be open. Not only these graves, but graves all over the world are going to be open. All the dead are going to be raised on that last day. And that's what we find here in these texts that, that we're looking at right here. When is that day going to be? Despite those who come along and claim they know something about that, no man knows when that day is going to be. God knows. And it will take place at the time of His choosing. To it, let's look at one more passage this evening, 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 3, there were those who were making fun. They were scoffing at the idea that Jesus is going to come again. And what a sad thing that is. What a tragic thing that is for people to be living a life like that. And the Apostle Peter answers that, and he answers that. I'm going to start there in verse 10 when he says, But the day of the Lord will come, he says, as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away the great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. He says, The day of the Lord will come. He doesn't say when. There might be some other questions we could ask that we don't have the answers to. I had a teacher many years ago that I think made a really good point when he said, the Bible is given to us not for speculation, but for application. Not given to us for reasons of speculation, but in order to practically fit our lives, that we might do what it says. And that's what Peter says here. He says, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Many years ago, when I was going to school at Florida College for a couple of years, we were sitting down there by the riverside. There was usually a weekly devotion, little talk somebody would make from the Bible, and I was down there one evening. And I was sitting by my roommate uh, in this little amphitheater. Some of you maybe have seen that have been there. And all of a sudden, there's a tremendous boom 
as the speaker was making his comments, and the sky lit up. I looked over at my roommate, and he was absolute terror. Well, of course, what had happened was this. Somebody had run into a telephone pole on the other side of the campus, and a transformer had exploded, whatever they do, made a really loud sound and a really big flash. Do you know what he thought? What went through his mind was, this is it, and I'm not ready. That's what terrified him. Well, one day there's going to be a shout. There's going to be the voice of the archangel. There's going to be the trump of God. This evening, what we talked about, everything that God had said He would do came to pass, and it came to pass on His schedule. And at the time of God's choosing, Jesus is going to come again. The dead are going to be raised. We're going to stand before Him in judgment. And it behooves us to be ready to avail ourselves to the grace and the love and the mercy of God to do the things that He has said that we must do in order to be saved, to have the forgiveness of our sins so that we can spend eternity with Him, not be in that horrible place that's described as hell forever and ever. By God's love and His grace and His mercy, God is so long-suffering Peter stresses that here in 2 Peter chapter 3. The question was, in essence, why hasn't Jesus come again? We need to look at it like this. Every day that Jesus doesn't come again manifests the long-suffering nature of God, doesn't it? If sinners who need to obey the gospel another day, another chance to repent and, and be obedient, to be baptized for the remission of their sins, another day for those maybe who have wandered astray to get their mind set right, spiritually attuned, and come back to Him. If you're here tonight and you recognize you're not ready for that great day, rest assured, it's going to come. It's going to come at the time of God's scheduling. But we need to be ready to meet Him when He does. If you're here, we can help you in some way. Render obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or maybe you've erred as an errant child of God. You've gone astray. Won't you come this evening as we stand and as we sing?